Hi, uh, good good morning, good afternoon, good morning, I think. Um, Wakas, are you online? Are we able to hear you? Are we able, we're checking to see if our participants online are able to, yes, so they can hear us. Hi, Dan, can you, can you hear us too? Yes, okay, great, there, and we can see you as well. Okay, great, good morning. thank you everyone. Apologies for the technical delays. It wouldn't be an IGF if there weren't internet connectivity or some other technical glitch. I think they just do it as a reminder to how important the internet is for all types of socioeconomic uh, activities, including news. So it's a good reminder of how important the work that we're doing is. I'm going to pass it to Courtney Ratch, who is going to introduce our session. Courtney? Great. Well, thank you for everyone joining us here in the room in Kyoto, as well as everyone online around the world. Um, we're really excited to have you here today because we think that there are very few issues that are as important as figuring out how to balance the need for technology, innovation, and governance and ensuring the sustainability of journalism and news media. So we are the Dynamic Coalition on Journalism and News Media. We're gonna kind of drop the sustainability because it's really long, so think of DC journalism going forward. Um, and today we're going to have a three-part session. So first we are going to hear from the authors of our annual report, uh, which is out now and we have some hard copies as well as digital copies that colleagues from the Global Forum on Media Development which help run the Secretariat will be sharing online and invite you to sign up for the mailing list so you can receive that. Um, then we're going to have an open forum for folks in the room and online who are interested in the, and working in this topic to share their own work and research. And so we'll invite you, um, we have invited several to, to participate in that, and this is again part of our efforts to make sure that this is a very dynamic, inclusive, wide-ranging discussion on the range of topics that sit at the intersection of internet governance and media sustainability. Um, and then we will have uh, a Q&A session and we'll talk a little bit about the Dynamic Coalition and what our plans are for the next year. And, and again, those are all set by the community. This is uh, a, an effort that we, our, uh, this year we determined, for example, that data, transparency, and access are essentially what we call the trifecta um, for media sustainability. And so every year we determine the priorities based on the input from the community. So um, with that, I want to welcome everyone who's here in Kyoto. Thank you for joining us and turn it over to, oh, I should probably mention, I'm one of the three co-coordinators of the Dynamic Coalition my name is Courtney Raj. I'm the director of the Center for Journalism and Liberty at Open Markets Institute, a think tank based in Washington, DC. Um, Dan O'Malley is another co-coordinator, and we're now going to move to our third co-coordinator, Wakas Naif, who is online, and we'll welcome our online participants. Wakas, over to you. Thank you, Courtney. A uh, warm welcome to everyone who has joined us online. Um, again, we apologize about the technical difficulties. Um, as Courtney mentioned at the Dynamic Coalition, we're really interested in hearing your insights and perspectives on the digital policies and the regulatory frameworks that affect new sustainability. Uh, this year, the coalition has also focused on uh, issues related to data sharing and transparency in data practices, especially in connection with uh, big tech companies. As many of you might have noticed during the year, um, there is uh, there seems to be a growing reluctance among big tech companies um, about um, the uh, distribution of news on their uh, platforms. Sometimes this is in relation to or in reaction to government policies, uh, and sometimes um, also in reaction to industry demands, um, which is why we feel that although many of us are working on these issues at the international level, uh, a lot of you who are um, uh, focusing on these issues at the local or national levels, your work also has a great deal of value for us, uh, especially in discussions such as the one we are about to have, a sort of global collaborative effort or debate on this topic. Um, so um, we really appreciate your interest. Please feel free to use the chat uh, to share your um, questions, comments, or suggestions, and we will try our best to uh, include them during the Q&A session. Uh, thank you once again. Looking forward to an excellent discussion. Uh, back to you, uh, Courtney and Dan. Great. Thank you, Wakas. 
Uh, my name is Daniel O'Malley from the Center for International Media Assistance, and now we're going to hop in to the first section of today's agenda, and that is um, the launch of our Dynamic Coalition's annual report, which I have copies up here up front if anyone wants to grab one after um, after the session's over. Essentially, as a Dynamic Coalition, you know, what our one of our goals is to make sure that we have a group of multi a, a multi stakeholder group. So we have about eighty participants coming from civil society, uh, media regulators, governments, uh, big tech companies, and uh, small tech companies as well, looking at these issues holistically because we think that oftentimes uh, the the issue of, of news is is focused just on like a content component and not necessarily on other issues like the the sustainability of news ecosystems. And as a dynamic coalition, we aren't just active for this one day, one uh, session at IGF. We actually have a series of activities that we do throughout the year as we try to collect information. So we do a series of, of quarterly learning calls. And one of the most important activities that we do is actually the, the creation of our annual report, where we try to capture a snapshot of some of the most important issues facing news media over the past year. And um, in, in particular, uh, this year's, um, and, and, and our report is a compilation of articles that are contributed by our members. So uh, we, it's, a, it's a collaborative, uh, crowdsourced effort to, to capture these topics. This year, there were kind of three big topics that came out through the contributions from our members. One is the, the power imbalance between media and tech giants. So that we have articles that are exploring how the dominant tech companies are redefining media sustainability uh, through controlling advertising uh, revenues and data. So looking at that relationship between big tech and media. Another one uh, that, that comes through in some of our articles is the, that government re regulations are a dual-edged sword. Um, so this explores how policies like data protection laws can both support or stifle uh, media affecting freedom and operational capabilities, for example. Um, we're in a regulatory period where there's a lot of work done in this area, and you know, Courtney's been at the, the front of a lot of these discussions, uh, you know, how uh, particularly regulations of like the DSA are impacting media, and we're seeing there's a double-edged sword there. There's some really great things that can come out of that, but there's also some, some challenges as well. Um, and then we also look into kind of some of uh, technological innovations and ethical dilemmas. In particular, uh, this year's topic that everyone's been speaking about, generative AI, and what does that mean for uh, the news media space, especially as large language models are trained on news content, um, as news organizations are going to start using generative AI technologies to, to do reporting, to facilitate communication. So looking at these new technologies and what that means for the practice of journalism as well as news ecosystems in general. Um, so I would, we, we have just launched our, re our report online today and for those who are in the chat I believe uh, online, I believe Laura is sharing the link. Um, and you can grab a copy up front. We're now going to have uh, a chance for some of our uh, article authors to discuss their contributions. So we have been having technical difficulties, but I believe that uh, Mike Harris may be online via Zoom. Mike, are you, are you there? Great. Okay, so Mike Harris is a co-founder. Give a brief introduction. I'll right. pass it to Mike. Mike Harris is a oh. co-founder of Exonym. He devised the decentralized rulebook system with uh, patents pending in both the U.S. and E.U. Has over 20 years of experience in ICT and is an expert uh, in distributed uh, privacy by design systems. And his article in this year's uh, uh, report is establishing independence and parity in the area of internet giants. And just because we have, uh, we've been a little bit delayed, I'm going to ask our speakers to keep their interventions to, to three minutes. Mike? Uh, hi, I'm, I'm not sure how, how I'll do with three minutes, but I'll get going. Good morning. Uh, today, I'm going to present a new technology that will help news media address the pressing challenges it faces with very large online platforms. The, the problem is simple. Today's digital infrastructure no longer supports the independence that the web was originally designed for, and that's vital for a healthy news media ecosystem. 
search and social media completely changed our information ecosystem. We moved from a model of competing with related products to one of opaque algorithms competing with all information. Real news, content that looked like news, state-sponsored disinformation are all treated equally. Aggregators like Facebook and Google control how information flows, not only shaping our individual worldviews, but directly capturing news media's primary revenue stream. This is in direct result of a network utilities taking ownership of web governance. Now, I'm speaking not as an expert in journalism, but as a technologist who has developed a tool to target this specific problem. Decentralized rule books are a new tool to establish standards, rules, and policies across the internet. They're not a platform or a blockchain, they're public documents that anyone can create. Joining a rulebook gives users credentials to access web services and benefits. The framework provides a new model of internet governance without centralized authority. So how does news media leverage this new model? Rulebooks empower the news media industry to differentiate its online content by publishing under higher standards of integrity. In other words, content that claims to be news will need to live up to the standards of journalism defined in the rulebook. Publishing under such a rulebook provides a trust signal which platforms and users can use to label and filter content. It's an authenticated blue tick that journalists can apply to increase trust in their publications. If they fall below standards, they can lose it and are subject to penalty when they want to get it back. The pace of everyday life calls for basic binary signals. This is in stark contrast to trust signals, which are not only highly contextual, but diverse. Here, the blue tick is enough to know that someone is accountable to upholding specific standards and rules. To better understand the context, consumers can click to read the rules and see who's managing them. We can see here that the article is moderated by the FT, which is regulated by the FCA and claims to be news. That claim is voluntary, so these rules can require truthfulness, yet can't limit free speech. The certificates are user generated so they can apply to a domain or a specific article. Moreover, they can even contain metadata so rules can mandate user tagging, say for adult content. A crucial feature for journalists is the system's ability to protect anonymity while still ensuring accountability. Journalists can publish in full adherence to rulebook standards without fear of direct identification. By deploying a rulebook, the industry would be providing content governance as an information layer for applications, and so it becomes easier to discuss what is fair with respect to governance. Rulebooks will move us from asking how do we achieve an outcome to what do we want to achieve? We are grateful to publish here today because we believe the IGF is the appropriate forum to initiate this kind of bottom-up user-driven policy deployment. The IGF observes an equal footing between stakeholders and rulebooks empower groups and organizations to realize this equal footing. So if you're determined to address these challenges, we would like to hear from you. So please do get in touch. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Mike Harris. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that uh, I really like about the IGF as well is that we have people with the technical community, people with these types of expertise that that Mike brings to our group um, who, who uh, challenge us to think about opportunities and innovation in, in new ways. I now want to um, check and see if Prue Clark is online and um, is able to join us. I am, Dan. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great to see you, Prue. So, Prue Clark is an international journalist, a nonprofit executive, and professor who has uh, reported from over 20 countries um, for leading publications such as the Washington Post, won awards including the Edward Murrow Prize, and Prue co founded and leads New Narratives, a nonprofit newsroom that collaborates with Global South newsrooms um, on investigative journalism and news business building. And she, along with her co-author, Maureen Shea, uh, 
wrote uh, uh, an article for the report called Digital Inno Innovation in Liberia's Media Sector, Challenges and Opportunities in Low-Income Democracies. So now, uh, if you could approve, I'll pass the word over to you. Great, thank you, Dan, and thank you to the Dynamic Coalition. I'm uh, really pleased to be able to have this opportunity to just flag something that's been really concerning a lot of people, I think, in low-income countries, that to a large extent, we're being left out of the opportunities that are coming for digital transformation. And uh, I really wanted to highlight some things, some work that we've been doing in Liberia with new narratives. So I just wanted to highlight that there are 19 low income countries left in Africa, according to the World Bank's latest rankings. That's uh, out of 24 in total. And we're seeing countries like Nigeria and Kenya, South Africa, and to a lesser extent, uh, countries like Ghana, where there are opportunities for news media to build better digital products, to better serve and monetize their digital audiences. They're coming from foundations, they're coming from digital platforms, and they're coming from governments. And they're really not coming to these low-income countries. Uh, we've just done some work with Swedish government funding with Liberia's leading newsrooms. We brought business and editorial leads from Premium Times in Nigeria, which a lot of you will know has really been breaking ground in Africa on uh, digital innovation, um, great new digital tools to do uh, journalism, but also to build an independent business model. So we brought them to Liberia to do a sort of hacks and hackers, which had never happened before. And it was a complete revelation to the Liberian news media who had no idea that they could make money from social media, that they, um, they didn't have the te technical capacity to develop apps and websites or donation or membership offerings. And they'd never really even heard of these opportunities before. They're still completely dependent on government advertising and payments from newsmakers uh, for distorted coverage. And, even when they really, really want to do great journalism, and, and there are a lot of very dedicated journalisms in these places, but they've not had the same opportunities to build independent revenue streams that Daily Trust or Premium Times have had in Nigeria or Daily Maverick in South Africa, for example. Um, and they've also not had the opportunities for grants to fund their journalism that media in larger countries have had. And of course, these are um, emerging democracies democracies, extremely fragile. We've seen eight military coups in the low-income countries of the Sahel region in the last two years. So I don't need to uh, tell you how important strong journalism is in these places to building democratic uh, resilience and to avert political instability, food insecurity that is driving migration to uh, Western countries now and is only going to increase um, as we go forward. So it's, it's, it's really vital. At the same time, news media in these countries have had no protection from the digital platforms. They're, they're completely consumed or subsumed by them. Facebook is the internet for two thirds of Liberians. Uh, the journalism content comes to them from Facebook. But to just to give you an example um, of how left out of the conversation they are, last year, the Daily Observer, the country's second biggest newspaper, was hacked and the hackers started sending out images of barely clad women from the Facebook page. Um, Facebook ignored all the pleas for help from the Daily Observer and it was only when Internews, that was working in the country with a USAID grant, stepped in that Facebook actually returned ownership of the uh, page to the media house. By that time, they had lost masses of Facebook users and they, their rival now has seven times the number of Facebook followers. So I, I, I just want to say I understand why bigger economies have an appeal. They have a larger middle class to monetize. They have more technological capacity. But I think that misses some really important advantages of quality news media in low income countries too, really. They have a captive diaspora audience who can't get their news from anywhere else. Uh, they are relatively wealthy and they live in democracies that place a high value on, 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 the, on journalism and its role in democracy. Um, secondly, these newsrooms have very low labor costs. So one of the leading newsrooms in Liberia told me they operate on just $50,000 a year. So it, you can imagine if they could convert just 1,000 audience members 
uh, in the diaspora to pay $50 a year, they would double their annual revenue immediately. But they've had no opportunity to develop a membership model uh, or, or any donation opportunities. Um, the media bosses estimated to us that just $10,000 would be enough to get them to the next level where they could really take advantage of the opportunities to monetize audiences. It's a small investment compared um, with, with the amounts of money that we've been spending to build these democracies in the first place. And I think it's uh, really essential that we, we start to think about these. So um, in my recommendations, just quickly, you know, that donors really start thinking about these, these uh, it, with more nuance about supporting news media in these countries, that they need to understand the opportunities that are available for digital transformation to build digital revenues, independent revenue streams. Um, they need to get away from this just supporting community radio and that's sort of the end of the story. Um, <clears throat> they should fund give grants to fund journalism in low-income countries. They need to work a bit harder to find the quality media, but, but if it's true that funding, uh, donor funding is needed to support um, American journalism, it's triply so in Africa, obviously. Uh, uh, great. Thank, also, thank you, Prue. We're going to... Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we have to move on. I mean, I think this is great. I mean, I think there are a couple of things here. You know, one... Two, one point, you know, it's important that we, when we have these news conversations that we incorporate you know, not just what's happening in the EU or in North America, but the, the entire global south, including least developed countries. And also an interesting component is the way that issues around um, trust and safety and, and, and flagging can also have impacts on media sustainability and users. Uh, so thank you very much. I'm now going to pass uh, to our, our next author, Juliette Nanfuka, who is sitting to my right and is a longtime friend of mine. She is a digital rights researcher and advocate who has worked on various initiatives to improve internet governance structures digital accessibility, and inclusion in Africa. Juliet works at the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa, also known as CIPESA, uh, a research center that helps policymakers understand ICT policy issues. And she contributed an article titled, Navigating the Uncertainty of Gen I in Ugandan Newsrooms. So I'll pass the mic to you. And if we could just keep our remarks to about three minutes. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone. Please excuse me, my flu is acting up this morning. Okay, so I'm from Uganda, as mentioned earlier, and I looked at the AI landscape in the country. I was really excited to do it, but I found it was very limited. Um, and on top of that, few wanted to actually talk about it due to the uncertainty and um, perhaps limited confidence that they had to talk about it, even as media owners to some extent. Nonetheless, there were a few people who spoke about it. I was looking at it through the lens of their perceptions on it and the greater scheme of things for the media industry when it comes to the global um, media sector. And I found that in comparison to other countries, we are struggling desperately in the country. As uh, Prue has pointed out, some of the challenges in Liberia are similar to what we have in Uganda of media viability, trying to stay alive what business models um, are we utilizing? How are we thinking about these things? Um, Uganda is right next door to Kenya, but behaves very differently in terms of how it structures itself as a business model, how it engages with its, med with its journalists, how it manages retention. Those are issues that we're struggling with in Uganda. But now we're going into this whole AI realm, which is introducing yet another layer to this whole media industry, but it's something that is um, creating a sense of uncertainty, but at the same time is not, has not spiked a sense of urgency in the sector, which I found rather alarming, especially as Mike pointed out, we, other countries are talking about rule books. They are at a very different level, while we are still struggling to get ourselves organized, even at a media guild level. At least that's in comparison to neighboring Kenya. So we are, as a media sector in the country, navigating way too much. We're trying to play catch up to models that other countries, more advanced countries, have long since moved past. And um, we are not adequately thinking about what AI is going to do to the landscape. Um, at a global level, we're aware of that, but we're not really factoring in what it's going to do to the landscape at a national level. Um, when I interrogated some media houses on their investment into, or their interest at least, into investing into navigating the AI space, it was very apparent that the budget, the funding for that, is not quite a priority. 
and such interests have then fallen onto individual journalists who are already struggling with poor salaries, who are already struggling to stay afloat with much of the trends in the media sector. Um, those who can afford it have taken the leap and are educating themselves, but how they will apply it in the media house is again another issue that many are yet to make sense of. There is um, an appreciation of what, how AI can be used to do big media stories, to do big data analysis, but again, those are not necessarily stories that media houses are chasing. Um, we did have a lot, uh, one, one thing I picked up was there's a lot of reliance on the civil society uh, sector to upskill journalists in that regard and to push for a type of content in media. However, it is still a slippery slope um, as civil society should not really be pushing content to journalists to go out and actually look for, for the stories. But I guess they were looking at it in terms of skills development. But I, m one of the arguments that emerged there was that it is not necessarily the, ro the role of civil society entities to train journalists. You're letting media houses get off the hook in terms of developing models that will enhance media training, media retention, rather the training of the, the retention of journalists in the media houses. So that was one of the issues that um, stood out for me. Um, that's it? Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great, Juliet. I mean, I think this is an issue that obviously everyone's talking about here, Gen AI, topic of the main session. So I think it's really interesting to think about it in our work and all the different angles, it's not just content production, it's business models, it's how people are engaging with news. Um, now I'm pleased to pass the mic to Courtney Ratch, who has already introduced herself, but she has uh, contributed an article that is titled Weaponizing U.S. Copyright and EU Privacy Law for Censorship Globally. Thanks so much. So I've long been interested in how um, tech platforms create an economic and political logic that constrain the viability and sustainability of news media around the world. And so what I recognized um, and, and, and found doing empirical work that included hundreds of interviews and surveys of journalists around the world, including technical um, assistance to get accounts back when they were closed because of um, copyright violations and increasingly privacy violations is that the techno-legal regimes of the United States and the European Union shape the visibility and viability of news media worldwide and yet there's an insufficient lack recognition of that by policymakers in those companies. Furthermore, the way that the dominant tech platforms, particularly the Meta and Google um, platforms, which are the you know, create the publishing audience um, monetization platforms for the vast majority of news media worldwide, um, create a possibility and constrain or create potentiality. They, they have to translate policies into technical um, policy and content moderation rules that affect news media around the world. So um, the US and EU copyright, so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, in particular the DMCA, and privacy laws like the GDPR, are inscribed into the global tech platforms through their AI systems, their content moderation procedures, their terms and services, and specifically things like notice and takedown or notice and stay down requirements, hashing and filtering. So we'll, we see that tech platforms will adjust algorithms to help reduce the visibility or the virality of problematic content, for example, or prevent its upload in the first place, which is what the DMCA does YouTube has interpreted the DMCA to create hashing databases that filter content at the level of upload. So we see in the United States, for example, that police officers specifically play cop very popular copywritten music in order to trigger the automated filters that will prevent journalists and citizen journalists from filming them when they are committing police abuses, for example. And that, that has actually now been instructed to, to police um, in some precincts. And so this is really problematic that a legal regime that exists is being weaponized and there is no um, penalty for, for doing this. Furthermore, what we see is that because the tech platforms that are based in the U.S., 
um, have a responsibility to implement the DMCA worldwide, this amounts to a global copyright regime. And because they receive statutory immunity, they only receive safe harbor if they prevent the, the copyright content from being uploaded. But they are not also responsible for ensuring that they are not weaponized by bad actors. Um, and, and there is also no meaningful action against content, content farms that plagiarize that content. So we know, for example, Facebook, as much as 60% of engagement comes from instant articles that are um, based on scraped content. So what we're seeing around the world is that criminals, corrupt officials, and a burgeoning industry devoted to influence operations and reputation management are weaponizing these techno-legal regimes to censor media with impunity. This is because of a failure of policymakers to rectify loopholes or enforce penalties like criminal pen penalties for false copyright claims and a failure of the technology platforms to redress recurrent abuses and improve safeguards for the media. Um, addressing these deep structural inequalities is essential if we're going to enable a viable news media around the world. Thanks. Great, thank you, Courtney. And uh, we now are gonna turn to uh, Juliana Harcianti who contributed an article Digital Regulation, Media Sustainability, and Freedom of Speech, which is a look at the situation in Indonesia. And um, Juliana is an independent journalist and researcher who has more than a decade of experience in the media industry. Um, she's a longtime contributor to Global Voices, a citizen journalism platform, uh, which advocates for a multilingual internet. And she has recently been active in Internet go Governance Fora and currently serves as the secretary of the Indonesia Internet Governance Forum. So, Juliana, I believe you're online. You have about three minutes to talk. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry I can open the video because it will be compromised my currency. Uh, I was talking about the regulation uh, about the, the digital law in Indonesia and the connection with the journalism uh, sustainability. Uh, when digital technology is immersed in Indonesia daily life, it's also affected in the journalism practice in many ways. Um, the Indonesia Press Board has recorded more than uh, 1,000 news sites in country with uh, nine, more than 900 operate predominantly in, in digital space. Uh, with all the changes, is uh, the, the digital space also uh, offering the new way for the journalists, the journalists and activists to express their voice in certain issue like uh, writing in blog, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and have a video in YouTube. As the digital technology is immersed in Indonesia, the government thinks it's need to have some regulation to make it more easier and much more safer for the citizen uh, who working and living in digital technology. Uh, uh, in 208, the government uh, has launched the in, uh, inter IT, IT, uh, IT law, in Internet and, and Transaction and Economic Law, with the main uh, subject is to protect the people who transaction in e-commerce. E uh, even though the main purpose of this regulation was to protect the digital transaction, uh, the law is content clause that allow people to file lawsuit against other internet users whose social media posts they found offensive. Uh, this law, uh, apparently, uh, after a few viewers has been launched, has been used by power, powerful entities to silence and to silence and punish critical journalism and activists who who often voice their concern about the corruption and for, uh, violation by the government or the the private sector who has more more pro, uh, power in an economic section. Uh, the the most common reason is to allay defamation against media professional. Often after a journalist has published a news article to hold official accountable to alleged corruption and violence. Uh, 
the last year uh, but the the regulation the, the formulation of regulation to protect the data data is still continue last year we the indonesia has the data protection law has been launched by the parliament uh, but it is still not clear it will be affected the the the, the journalism uh, sustainability and environment the freedom of expression because the this uh, problematic ITE law is still in force and the, the civil society journalism and some organization uh, has still struggling to appeal to government to to revise some problematic clause and article so it's for me great thank you thank you juliana and we'll be paying attention as uh, you know there's elections coming up in indonesia to see how these cyber policies are enacted and the ways that they may impact uh, news organizations, journalists, uh, and kind of the information system there. Um, and, and last but not least, I have a contribution to this year's report, uh, which was uh, Bridging the Gap, How Data Sharing Can Transform Media Development in the Digital Age. And essentially what I was looking at in this article was kind of a, a you know, we had identified, obviously data is very important. People often use the analogy that data is the new oil. And so it's kind of thinking, how can we mine this new resource for the, the, the media development uh, goals that we have? And oftentimes in, in our communities, we, th we think, oh, if we just have the data. We need the data. We need the platforms to share data. But one of the questions that what we really wanted to look at is exactly what type of data are we talking about? And um, what I've tried to do in this article is to kind of define the different buckets, because I think that there are different people working in this space on different topics who require different types of data and different da different types of data could be be useful. And so what I try and do in this article is what I do in this article is quite look at those buckets. Um, and so the first one is a bucket on audience engagement and monetization. This is uh, d you know data that tech platforms would have that could inform um, how you know un understanding better the ad tech stack, how much money is made off of news content. This is one that's the type of data that when we're talking about news media bargaining codes that is of quite interest to news organizations. So I kind of see that as one, one bucket. Uh, the next bucket is con uh, data around content narratives, user behavior, and coordinated behavior. So oftentimes in our space, we're talking about you know online violence against journalists, especially female journalists. And the type of data that you would need to marshal to understand those kind of challenges is slightly different. Um, and this is also an area where there have been significant challenges in getting the, the uh, tech platforms to share that data. But understanding what that data is is really crucial. And then the third one that I think has been talked about less in our space as I've had these conversations over the past year is data around cybersecurity. Oftentimes, these global platforms, you know, the, the big tech platforms or other companies like Cloudflare have a sense of what type of uh, cyber attacks are taking place against either individual journalists or news organizations, um, sometimes which, you know, if they're state sponsored even. But um, when security, when it operates in, in correctly, no one, we don't even know about it, that, that it's happening, right? But still that those attacks are happening could be really influential in trying to proactively protect organizations that are under attack but might not know it. So that was another set of um, of, of another bucket of data that I think could be really helpful. And I think this is an important issue because we can, it'll be easier to kind of engage with uh, the, 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 the people who possess this data if we have more clarity around what we're asking for and for what purposes. Um, I mean, I think that this is, uh, especially in this year in the kind of, uh, we're seeing actually, you know, backward trends in terms of data sharing in some ways as trust and safety teams have been decreased. There, it's kind of less engagement by, by platforms there. It seems to be kind of a race to the bottom as we have more digital regulation and companies are now thinking about this as a compliance issue with laws, especially coming out of Europe. But there's also kind of some hope in there because some of these new regulations are in including transparency components that require the sharing of some types of data. So I think there's also the hope in that um, and these efforts as well. And so just as kind of the path forward, I see, you know, I think standardizing our data requests and having a better sense of what specific data we're talking about is going to be really helpful. 
I think that um, you know cross sectoral alliances for equitable data utilization is one thing that we're thinking about. I know that um, Internews's Media Viability Accelerator in partnership with Microsoft, you know, there's some hope that these types of partnerships can can lead to something. Whether that will pan out, um, it's hard to know. Obviously, data is becoming even more important, and in the AI space, is a generative AI depends on data, and that's one of now Microsoft's you know comparative advantage. So we'll see how that works. And then I think the other thing is that we need to have a, a global approach to data transparency and media support. And this goes to a point I think that Courtney was also making around how the policies that we develop, you know, in the EU, in North America, in the global West, we need to think about what that data transparency policy, how it might impact other places, uh, you know, in positive ways. So we've seen data protection laws implemented in places where, when not done with the, guard, right, the right guardrails, actually impinges on press freedom. So we need to really think about what we're doing, where we are, and how that impacts others. Um, so that is, uh, you know, this is all a plug. Hopefully we've given you a little teaser of everything that you can find in the annual report. We have copies here that you can pick up after the session, and we also have copies online. Um, that's all for, for, the, for this uh, portion of our um, of our agenda. I think we're going to need to skip the Q&A uh, or combine it because we have uh, a lot to get to in the next 40 minutes. So I would ask people to kind of hold those questions. Um, and, and as we move to um, the next session that I think the next section of our agenda that Wacus is going to uh, talk about the member spotlights and maybe we combine those all here what some of our uh, DC sustainability members are working on and then we can have an open discussion that can include questions to the authors. So I'm going to pass it over to uh, Wakas. Thank you, Dan. Um, we will now invite one by one our coalition members who had expressed interest in speaking up at the session uh, to introduce their organization's work and share updates on uh, recent or upcoming initiatives uh, that they or their organizations are taking related to digital governance and uh, news media sustainability. Um, in the interest of time, we will request each speaker to limit their uh, interventions to three minutes so we can accommodate um, as many speakers as we can uh, and still leave time for some open, open discussion after this. Um, we also request our speakers, uh, and this is something that the Dynamic Coalition is really interested in, uh, is to share any inputs regarding uh, areas for future research or um, stakeholder engagement that may be facilitated by the Dynamic Coalition. Uh, first, I believe we have a written message from uh, Michael Markowitz uh, from the Gibbs Media Leadership Think Tank in South Africa. Uh, who recently organized uh, a conference there that resulted in the drafting of uh, global principles for uh, news media bargaining uh, with big tech companies. Dan, do we have a written statement? Yes, we do. And Nick Benequesta from SEMA is going to read out uh, what Michael, Thank who, you. Uh, uh, who was unable to because of the time difference, uh, participated. Great. Thanks. Um, Hi everyone, Nick Benacrista from the Center for International Media Assistance. Just uh, reading out a message from Michael Markowitz, who is the head of the Gibbs Media Leadership Think Tank. Gibbs is the Gordon Institute of Business Science. Um, so uh, Michael wanted to draw attention to an important event that was held in July uh, in Johannesburg uh, entitled Big Tech and Journalism, Building a Sustainable Future for the Global South. And uh, that event uh, brought together 70 participants, journalists, news publishers, media organizations, scholars, activists, lawyers, and uh, economists from 24 different countries to discuss solutions to the crisis of sustainability of journalism and its intersection with the role of major tech platforms. <clears throat> that uh, event focused in particular on bar news bargaining codes, uh, such as the one in Australia, the one in Canada, uh, a model, a law being discussed uh, in Indonesia. And uh, the speakers came to a number of, of interesting conclusions, which he's outlined uh, in this written contribution today. I think owing to limits on time, I'm not going to read all of the conclusions uh, that they reached. But I, d I did, I think the most important issue here, uh, or the most important finding to highlight is that, uh, or conclusion to highlight, is that they, they concluded with a, a statement on principles, uh, the adoption of principles of big tech and journalism, principles for fair compensation. Um, we can probably share the link if someone's online. 
uh, if they have it. Um, otherwise, we'll share it with the group later uh, if you don't have it already. Uh, these principles are not just applicable to the Australian style bargaining codes, but intended to be universal, serving as a framework for any country seeking to address media sustainability through compensation or regulatory mechanisms while enabling adaptation to unique contexts. So, so far the principles have endor been endorsed by 101 individuals uh, and organizations from 28 countries. And the principles are intended to be taken forward in three ways. Um, that he highlights in his message to the group. Uh, first, uh, Michael and the, the signatories hope that these principles can be used as a campaigning document for all stakeholders in lobbying for new mechanisms to address media st sustainability through fair compensation. Uh, so they, they, they're keen to build alliances with networks that you may be involved in and other think tanks and civil society groups to work on this. Second, um, they hope to submit the principles as part of the civil society filings to the South African Compensation Commission's market inquiry. So they're using these principles nationally for some very interesting reform efforts in South Africa. And thirdly, uh, they believe that the principles and other conference outcomes have highlighted areas for further research. So look to the, for those who are researchers, look to those principles uh, for a, a continuing research agenda. Thanks. Um, thanks so much. And if anyone wants in the room wants to learn more, I was there, so happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nick and Courtney. Uh, we've also shared the link for the principles in the chat. Uh, next up, I believe, um, if Anna Christina is in the room, um, she's Senior Program Specialist at UNESCO. Anna, if you're able to join us, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, as you know, UNESCO has been developing since uh, September 2022 uh, guidelines for the governance of digital platforms that will be released on the 25th of October this year. And I think th that it's important to say a little bit about how these guidelines are now um, related to the media sustainability and uh, recognitions of journalist safety. So the guidelines are affirmative about the need uh, to involve the media and its professional in the regulatory process in whatever kind of regulatory processes, uh, independently of is, is, if it's uh, self-regulation, core regulation, or uh, statutory regulation. The guidelines outline that any kind of governance system should promote the dialogue between the media and the digital platform for the investment of independent media and for the support of ecosystems by making data available and supporting actions to bolster media sustainability, diversity, and plurality. Third, the guidelines um, are very stre uh, stressed uh, a lot about the due diligence processes that the platform should put it forward in order to assess the human rights impact of the treatment of independent news publishers and journalist content, to ensure equal treatment of independent news organization, to establish procedures to guarantee, to guard against the potential misuse of reporting rules and moderation mechanisms, especially misuse in bad faith designed to censor journalists and finally, the guidelines say that the digital platforms are expected to provide access to data for researchers, but also to journalists when there is a public interest on the access in proportionate and necessary in the determined context. But how? Now, we developed another set of consultations uh, specifically to identify the type, the type of data sets that should be released by digital platforms specifically related to the safety of journalists and media viability. Um, which uh, we will be releasing a policy brief that uh, that uh, mentions the specific data asked and the different uh, challenges that we are facing when it comes to data access. And, and, and then we are going to uh, become, after the publication of the guidelines, we are going to start a process of implementation of the guidelines where we are going to define through a multi-stakeholder network that will be established in different uh, regions, particularly Latin America, uh, Africa, uh, the Arab states, and Asia Pacific. Um, the definition of a work plan and indicators for a follow-up of, of these principles. What we want to understand is to have, uh, is, is, is to know how this could be real and oper uh, operational in the different context and considering the different realities and what is actually needed in, 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 each, of the, in each of the regions. 
Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, next up, I will request Julius Endert um, from the DW Academy to yes, share I'm here. their updates. Thank you, Julius. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, so could you could you show my slide here in the room? Is it possible? So yes. Um, so this is a. Um, so I'm Julius Endert from the DW Academy from the Deutsche Welle in Germany. So this is a a, um, a call to action for. AI media development, um, because we see that AI is a disruptive technology for media. But we started thinking, so what's, what is the disruption for our sector the in, in media development? And it, it will be the as same as disruptive for, for us as it is for, for media. I think this is clear. And we started to um, with with our own consultations about the question, uh, and I think this is the the, the strongest quote from Walid Al Al Sakaf. Uh, he's a uh, professor and senior lecturer from the um, Södertörn University in Stockholm, and he said that we need to build branches within the in media development explicitly for AI. Otherwise, we became uh, irrelevant as media organizations ourselves. So it's ob about the sustainability of the media development sector as a whole. And um, so I don't want to capture it, but uh, I, I think I, it's good to visualize it. And we developed as uh, a kind of pilot four-step approach for, um, for AI impact in media development. So we have to ask ourselves the question, uh, how can we have and still have impact under the rule kind of AI? And how can we use AI to have more and maybe different impact? And and for us, it's it's crucial. And I learn this every day for myself. We need to understand uh, the the te the technology and have a deeper understanding uh, of the technology in the first place. And that also means that we need to build capacity within our own organization. So we need to have technical expertise. We need to have technical knowledge. We need to test things. Otherwise, we cannot build on on AI or uh, mitigate the risk of the AI. And then even on the same level or even more important is we need to analyze re and research, and this was the question before, what is the impact on freedom of speech and human rights? There are so many aspects um, how AI is influencing freedom of speech um, and also maybe a philosophical, a philosophical question do we need to to vote for freedom of speech for AI? So this is also a question. And then uh, at the next level, we need to detect the gaps in every field of media development and develop ca capacity. So so this is media viability, media sustainability. This is digital rights. This is media information literacy. This is journalism education and more, and also advocacy, uh, because every field um, will see the effects of AI. So this is also clear. And then on the on the uh, uh, fourth level, we need to see what a what impact could we have with AI and how can we mitigate risk from uh, from AI. And that means that we we need also as a sector develop our own ethics. We did we need to develop our own positions. Um, and also we need uh, so we need to be more innovative how we can use AI in our own uh, projects with our partners. And the whole thing, and this is wha what we hear a lot, um, AI is so fast in its development and especially generative AI. This, this needs to be an iterative process and uh, we, we need to do it again and again. And it's also clear that we can do it alone as one organization. We need to collaborate um, and involve our partners, like um, like uh, um, you from uh, from Uganda. Uh, I think you we are on the same page uh, in in develop um, yeah these kind of approaches. Yeah, and this is what I want to contribute. Thank you. Thank you, Julius, and thank you for pointing out, you know, the the opportunity for um, collaborations and engagements. Um, people uh, from different parts of the world working on the same issues. Uh, next, uh, I'll request Michael Bach, the executive director of the Forum on Information and Democracy, uh, to please share their um, update. Uh, good morning, everybody. 
Um, <clears throat> so the, the Forum on Information and Democracy is the implementing entity of a global process called the International Partnership on Information and Democracy, which started a few years ago by a dozen or so democratic states. Uh, we've now reached 51 countries that have signed on to the partnership. Brazil was the 51st uh, at the end of August. Uh, and at the forum as the implementing entity undertakes a bit of work at the interface of research and policy. One of those areas is conducting working groups on specifically targeted issues to develop recommendations for states, uh, civil society, and other actors advocating for uh, the positive impact of technology on our democratic institutions and the information ecosystem. Uh, late last year, uh, sorry, earlier this year, we published a, a report from a working group around uh, pluralism of information in curation and indexation algorithms. It's a lot of, um, <laughs> very difficult to roll off the tongue, uh, but essentially the group was comprised of renowned experts uh, across the world who drove the writing of the report and the development of the recommendations drawn from uh, experts through networks of civil society and academia, really looking at um, how to improve the pluralism of news that we see uh, in our online spaces. More specifically, they looked at how to give us more control in enhancing the quality and pluralism of the news that serve to us on online services, to give us more transparency and control over how our personal information is used to deliver that content to us and to pave the way for more decentralized approaches that may differ from the sort of um, dominant models that we see in the marketplace. When that report is delivered, we then work through the state signatories to disseminate through regulatory agencies, uh, people who influence policymakers, and NGOs throughout uh, our networks around the world uh, to influence the kinds of policies that are being developed. And just a few weeks ago, uh, we launched our next cycle of policy working group on artificial intelligence and the impact on our democratic institutions and the information ecosystem. And that's uh, moving forward uh, and a report will be issued uh, in uh, mid next year, I think. Uh, another part of our team very quickly uh, works at gathering evidence under the umbrella of the Observatory on Information and Democracy. And we've just uh, launched the steering committee of which Courtney is a member. And we've only met online, so awkwardly is the first time we're <laughs> seeing each other in person. And the, the observatory really drives an effort to obtain a common understanding of the state of knowledge and what we understand uh, of the impacts of technology on democracy and the information ecosystem. Uh, the steering committee will be driving a process of several working groups, of which one is around uh, media in the digital age. Uh, and that will be a meta-analysis and delivered uh, towards the end of next year. And we'll be seeking contributions from uh, uh, NGOs with a research profile and uh, other academics. In terms of suggestions for uh, research areas and things that we need to do, I guess one of the themes that's really important to me is to ensure that we continue and do more to ensure diverse voices and experiences, backgrounds and disciplines make their way into our policy discussions. It's not enough that these take place in, in the North, in the typical research centers that we think about. Uh, I've spent most all of my life in the South, in Southeast Asia, and it, to me, bringing those perspectives uh, to the research centers is particularly important, and that's a priority for our organization. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, we will now move online uh, to um, Sabanaz Rashid Dia, who works on policy, human rights, and AI uh, at the Tech Global Institute. Sabanaz, if you can please share your contribution. Thank you. Thanks, Vakas, and thanks everyone for having us. Um, so Tech Global Institute is a nonprofit tech policy lab with a mission to reduce equity gaps between the global south and tech platforms. 
We are powered by a community of policy, human rights, and trust and safety professionals who, are direct, who collectively have years of insider knowledge and leadership roles at the largest tech companies and government agencies around the world. Uh, our policy research currently focuses on disinformation, platform accountability, privacy, content governance, and AI through a global South equity lens. Um, with relation to the, to the content that was shared today, and I think I agree a lot with what Courtney has mentioned, I think our consistent finding across different bodies of work that we do is that the discrepancies and the systemic barriers uh, in how platforms organize and provide access to data to researchers and journalists in the global south. If you look at the publicly disclosed records of the largest US tech platforms, close to 80% of all research funding and data access have been provided to elite institutions in North America, Western Europe, and Australia, despite the fact that they only represent less than 40% of the world's internet population. This creates a significant information asymmetry that prevents local journalists, researchers, academics from understanding, informing, and influencing technology's impact on society, as well as the lack of local context in these kinds of research ends up reinforcing structural biases against underrepresented communities in these markets. Uh, this particularly impacts media because I remember a particular instance where during the pandemic, journalists from Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Nepal, for example, were denied access to Facebook's data under its established data sharing agreements that prevented these uh, organizations from studying the impact of COVID misinformation, disinformation on the information ecosystem, and that broadly then impacted how they would then survive during the pandemic, as well as what their editorial policies could be to counter the negative information ecosystem. So this creates a, a lot of challenges across multiple layers. Um, in this forum, we talk a lot about some of the regulatory frameworks, and I think Courtney talked a lot about how these are being weaponized in many instances. I think I want to draw attention to the work that we're doing with the EU Digital Services Act, particularly recognizing that the regulatory obligations on data sharing uh, are there to encourage accountability, and there seems to be a lot of energy to actually position this as, as a gold standard uh, globally. However, uh, it raises critical questions on whether the same framework can be applied in other parts of the world. Seven out of 10 countries today are deemed to have hostile and repressive media environments under rising authoritarianism, which means that journalists and media professionals often turn to social and alternative internet platforms to express and dissent. Uh, therefore, if such a model is kind of taken all around the world, it raises questions on whether this, it raises questions on this backdrop on whether these would actually work in different kinds of contexts and whether we even want more government sanctions and scrutiny on user access to data or journalist access to data. Uh, particularly given, the, given our experience with the weaponization of cyber and data protection laws in, in many of global South markets. It raises questions around who will have access, how can states be held accountable on fairness and neutrality criteria, and would such an access inadvertently work against the media and research communities in less mature democracies? Therefore, I think it's important, and our work is, is looking at these questions on whether uh, what kind of data access models would actually work in global South context how how would they actually be able to navigate less mature democracies and what kind of questions and procedural safeguards should be applied when we think about data access in in different kinds of um, contexts and jurisdictions now uh, we recommend for further research that and i think there's a lot of focus these days around um, solutions and and what should be done i think our focus is largely around how it should be done we believe that imposing procedural safeguards imposing more evaluations into processes into access as opposed to what the data is actually saying will actually make it a lot more meaningful and neutral and less politicized when journalists and media in different environments are able to access the data. Um, and uh, that will also establish more guardrails, particularly in less mature democracies where there are these broad provisions copied from other, other jurisdictions in terms of data access that will actually provide guardrails in terms of how it can be accessed, who's getting the access, and whether it's actually ultimately serving the interests of journalists and media communities in these markets. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Savanaz. Uh, important points there. Uh, Dan, we have Ramiro Alvarez um, on the list, but I'm not sure. OK. So Ramiro is the vice director and researcher at the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression um, from Argentina. Please go ahead, Ramiro. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, at Sele, we have been uh, looking at the issue of media viability, and we started out basically with a basic concern about freedom of expression and the need to have a 
quality journalism as uh, building block of democratic society. And what we started doing was just trying to understand where the conversation was going. Um, and what we tried to do is try to understand um, the situation in Latin America. What we basically found was that there was a series of policy areas that was relevant to the issue of media viability or sustainability, which in Latin America in particular, uh, th there are a couple of areas that are very important. Subsidies, state subsidies that in Latin America are often uh, passed in the form of public advertising. Public advertising in itself is a huge source of revenue for uh, legacy media companies. Um, Government-run media is also a huge part of the conversation. Uh, the problem that we usually have in Latin America is that government-run media is uh, not independent. It's part of uh, parts of the government and are sort of partisan tools. Uh, and the other specific issue that we found is across countries that eth ethical shortcomings in journalism were a huge matter of concern. Um, and what we found is that all these policy areas were basically uh, talking to, were not talking to each other. There are uh, siloed conversations that really um, fail to produce uh, consistent policy proposals. And, and what we have identified as the need for future research and advocacy and engagement is the need to build bridges between those different silos. Um, in, in that sense, we started with a hypothesis that was that perhaps regional conversation should take place, but because of the problems are very specific to every single country, we thought best that the best way to do it was to try to produce uh, conversations first at the national level to later move up the ladder to, to achieve some kind of regional conversation. Um, but one of the main biggest challenges that we found there is that all these different siloed conversations are crossed by deep and pervasive disagreements between different people who don't think that the solutions are about the same place. So critical scholars uh, working on media studies, for instance, are usually not willing to speak to media owners. Media owners think that uh, community radio operators are fringe group of people who should not be included in the conversation. So that requires kind of policy work or politics uh, that it's really hard to achieve. And our initial conversations with people in different countries basically agree that our diagnosis is, uh, is correct. Um, so that's where our future research is going to go. But I do want to mention, because it came up during our conversation today, that uh, we're also working on that access uh, for researchers, because obviously it is a huge part of, of this conversation, and we believe that the DSA offers opportunities, and we're starting to build the case for that access to non-European Union members, which is difficult, it has its challenges, but we believe there is an interest in the Global South to do that, and we are, we're trying to be part of that conversation as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. That actually um, wraps up our, our uh, contributions from our members. So we're now gonna open up the floor to any kind of questions, either from the first session of uh, article uh, presenters or also, uh, you know, something that uh, another member wants to say. So if, uh, if you just want to come up to the mic uh, and maybe get in line and then we'll do that. And also just to plug that we're going to, you know, we have another annual report next year. We've heard a lot of really interesting topics. So we'll have uh, a call for uh, the next submissions coming out in the next couple of months. Uh, excellent panel and what a what a great contribution you guys are making. Thank you, uh, especially I love the the issues regarding uh, the DC. Could the you MCA. introduce yourself? Oh, I'm so sorry. Did I? Zai Jamil, I'm, I'm an attorney. I work in uh, policy, and I work with uh, businesses in in Pakistan. That's where I'm from. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, number one, uh, I'm going to talk about very quickly secret takedown orders. Uh, think about it. When the government makes a request to take something down. Where does it get recorded, and how do people know? It doesn't. Uh, there's a transparency report that the, that the tech companies do publish, but it doesn't tell you who and what and what happened. That's number one. The second thing, I think, we are all concerned about chat GPT, and we're saying AI, well, God, you shouldn't put this out there. If, this is so dangerous, and we want principles against it. But when the EU put out GDPR, 
and it's being implemented in countries where now they're saying the data protection authority should be under the Ministry of Security. I'm worried. Where are they? Where's the EU to explain to people that data protection is not about protecting data, it's about privacy. It's about protecting citizens' data against the government, not protecting the government's data, which is what's happening. Two points, that's it. Thank you so much. If I can just respond very briefly, the Christchurch call advisory, the Christchurch call process is really um, advocating for government transparency reports and working on them to report on uh, their takedown requests related to TVAC, terrorism and violent extremism content. So that might be something to look at in that respect. And I can agree with you more on the data protection issue because we saw in several countries in um, Central Europe so that the data protection authorities leveraged GDPR to try to take down investigative journalism Correct. and the databases they're using to do that. So and thanks for that. Victimization. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, this is Handan Oslu from uh, Turkey's uh, Internet Observatory, Gözlem Evi. Uh, so um, I have, firstly, a product placement. So in Gözlem Evi, we also uh, create some creative methods to generate data when it's not available. And through our research, we identified some stuff such as we found that uh, Facebook's political advertisement was being micro-target 90% to men, mostly. So we have all of these findings that kind of intersect all of these issues that we talk about. And we also identified uh, phishing operations created by AI, sent AI central micro-targeting, lack of governmental action, and taking them down, in which government officials are being um, represented falsely, so phishing operations, two million Turkish citizens uh, affected, so much going on. So uh, Turkey can be a great space to identify, but also generate great uh, new data. And uh, we also have an algorithmic empowerment program, which uh, does exactly uh, try to address the problems that you pointed out in terms of empowering media, because as ex-Google employees, we also know how search engine optimization and other stuff work too, so we have this new program. My, uh, I actually had a, uh, in regard to the academic research areas that you uh, were asking for, I was just wondering if you're interested in investigating how big tech companies coordinate and comply with authoritarian governments and, um, and what that looks like and, uh, what, what do, and how do you think you can uh, generate data on things that happen behind doors and what could the potential impact be. I think this will especially be important considering that there is more than 50 elections, I think, coming up uh, next year. And finally, we also are going to launch an election monitoring workshop for other investigators that would like to do uh, monitoring on their elections since we just had one last year. And thank you so much for all of the speakers. It was great to listen to. Thank you. I mean, definitely, I'm sure all of us are interested in that. And I would just encourage you, if you can come um, give us your cards so we can share your information online, even uh, at least for the name of your organization. Hi, and thank you so much for your insights and amazing inspirations. It's Jubo from Georgia. I work at Forset, which is nonprofit CSO. We help civil society with open data solutions. Uh, we work a lot with journalists in Caucasus and Central Asian countries to boosts their data collection, data analysis, and visualization skills. And I would like to, within one minute, reflect on media and open data relations that we talked a lot about today. Uh, we talked about making data accessible, but I think another issue and problem and question is what we actually do with this data once it's accessible, once it's open, right? We have worked with hundreds of journalists in these couple of countries, and they say that newsrooms are way too dynamic to afford spending two weeks on data investigations and data-driven stories uh, to publish them. Mm, they can barely afford it because they are not financially sustainable, right? And another issue is that in our target countries, state authorities are disclosing less and less data so that journalists can make sense of what's happening. In, in the in the country. Um, so in response to this, uh, Forset with other CSOs started developing tech solutions that scrapes data from websites, news agencies, social media platforms, so that if state is not giving journalists data, we can give journalists data. But now what we see is that our tech solutions is losing uh, value because TikTok's data is I mean, Twitter's data is gone, API is closed, 
Uh, we have issues with Facebook's API as well because it is limiting API almost every year. We have issues with TikTok's data as well. So I don't like to be drama queen, but challenges are uh, growing instead of decreasing. And now we have generative AI coming in. So I think we should really, uh, of course, talk about making data accessible and invest in this, but also invest in actually utilizing this data for everyday work in media and academy. Thank you. But I think that's a great point about you know data. That there is so much data. What kind of organizations? And we need to think about it for, probably from an ecosystem standpoint. So what kind of can media support organizations do as well? Yes, next question. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenna Fong. I am an amateur uh, policy researcher and a casual policy observer based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, I want to bring up one thing um, probably covered in one of these research already. Uh, but I hope that the audience here might, um, you know, have, have like a basic understanding about the reason Bill C-11, the Online New News Act, happening in Canada, which uh, they require tech companies like Google and Meta to pay to news outlet uh, for posting or linking their contact. And in just, if I remember correctly, in August 2023, Meta responds as to be complied with the law and by removing news completely from Facebook and Instagram, their social media platform that does not only include the domestic news, but international news. I am originally from Hong Kong. A lot of news outlets closed down due to the political uh, tension um, happening in, in Hong Kong in the past couple of years. And I moved a country uh, to access this freedom and end, end up I am receiving this from a supposedly democratic country. Uh, and and so um, I hope that you know um, we, what what will be the place and, and what should be in place to make sure that we can balance out the power that uh, the big tech is controlling because they are regulating uh, this publicly uh, privately owned public space that we lived on, and uh, make sure the policy is human centric and um, and you know. Um, and not jeopardizing consumers' right to access information and ensure the sustainability of media ecosystem. And, and, and take this as an example, how will other jurisdictions with even less comprehensive legal framework to deal with such backlash from uh, this kind of legislation and tension between big tech and government and ensure that um, the interests of consumer and media industry are truly considered and integrated? Thank you. Also, I would just note, it's not that the that Meta can't comply, it's choosing not to pay. It is not a lack of compliance um, issue. Thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. My name is Claire Mohindo from Uganda. And um, working with the African Center for Media Excellence, a media support organization. Uh, we've done studies around uh, media freedom, and one of the latest, uh, latest study was around um, biometric digital identity programs and how they've impacted uh, media freedom in Uganda. Biggest challenge while we were collecting uh, data for this study was um, the fact that journalists and uh, media owners that we interviewed did not have an idea about the study about biometric digital identity programs. So while collecting this data, you literally have to explain everything for them to give you the responses that you are looking for. So um, here to pick lessons from uh, people working in the Global South. Um, what uh, lessons can we pick from you and what practical solutions can we walk away with on how you navigate such issues, especially seeing that uh, in our context, uh, people are navigating different issues, issues of media viability, sustainability, and then there's all of this, so you have to like sort of catch up, like Julie said. So there's just so much to deal with. The media houses are struggling, and there are all these all these issues affecting them that they don't even realize uh, they're being affected. Because uh, some of our findings showed that yes. So after we explained what it's all about and showing that 
all these massive registrations going on and the government storing our data, people are being uh, surveilled on this ongoing surveillance of journalists, but people are not aware, receiving anonymous calls from people or threatening them and telling them, you know, you can't run this and you're like, okay, where did you get this data from and all these challenges, but we do not realize that. So uh, here to pick lessons from everyone working in the Global South. Thank you. Great, well, we are at time, so I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes to try to summarize what has been truly an incredible uh, conversation that has, I think, spanned the entire globe and illustrated why this conversation is needed at the Internet Governance Forum, a global multi-stakeholder space where we have addressed today the individual level issues, whether that's journalists, news outlets, kind of the individual organizations, the need to build capacity to figure out how to transition to the age of AI, um, while understanding that they have a constrained choice set. They are bound by, an, by a logic, by technological infrastructure, by policy infrastructures, um, over which they often have very little impact or control over. Um, we've talked a lot about the global influence of national or kind of supranational in the case of EU level policies that you know you may be a, an organization working in a developing or low income country um, but you are forced to comply with and figure out how to build an audience to monetize etc and, and create viability and sustainability based on rules that are not of your own making, based on a logic that you have no control over, and oftentimes which you have no ability to even try to gain remedy to, as we heard um, in the case of content moderation, this constraining factor, the, the unequal structural inequalities between journalists and media organizations in different parts of the world in terms of their access to remedy when um, tech platforms influence their the visibility viability of their content or their accounts etc um, we heard about the importance of data on multiple layers what data what data do we need how do we get it and what do we do with it once we have it how could we come up with a global uh, maybe coordinated agenda we heard about the global principles for fair compensation that was a similar effort to see like Globally, where is there consensus about some general level of principles? I think we need to do that, it sounds like, for data. It sounds like we're hearing a call for this. What are some, what is a common agenda for the types of data we need? Um, how could we leverage institutions or, or existing mechanisms like the DSA um, and leverage those for both European and non-European entities? Side note, as an American, we also don't have any model for that, so we're interested in looking at that. So I think, um, that. but then what do we do with that data, um, as we heard uh, you know, from one of our speakers? Well, okay, so once we have access, how do we both internally at the media organization level, um, how do we turn that into improved policies that improve safety of journalists? How do we improve monetization? What do we do with that data? How do we make that useful? Um, and we heard about the importance of working globally with local knowledge and local input and empirical based input, especially thinking about those who work in the global north or have access to the seats where policies are being made um, and discussed, that we represent and we create opportunities for engagement and access by those who don't typically get a seat at the table or are not offered a space at the table. And I will say that I think that's one of the things that I'm really proud of about this dynamic coalition, about the, all of the people in this room and online who are doing that. That is a fundamental core commitment of this dynamic coalition. And yes, we do talk about you know, the, the EU and US policies a lot because of their constraining impact. But we are also very interested, you know, we heard about Uganda, um, what is happening in Liberia. These are, as the Internet Governance Forum kind of conveys, they're local issues with global implications and global issues with local implications. So I would invite everyone to please consider joining the Internet Governance 
forums, Dynamic Coalition on Journalism and News Media Sustainability, um, join our mailing list. Use the mailing list. Um, we hold learning calls, as you heard from Dan. We will be organizing those over the coming year, and we will be holding a meeting in the next couple of months to determine what should the priorities for the coming year be. Undoubtedly, that will cover generative AI. We already heard a bit about some of the issues that we need to be thinking of. Um, you know, this, this, these four-part issues, how does media development adapt? How do news organizations adapt? How do we think about AI governance and its impact on news media? Um, I do invite you to our session at 1.30 where we will be talking about AI governance for the global majority. And with that, I would like to thank everyone. Thank you for the people online. Thank you to Wakas. Um, thank you to all of the presenters. And thank you to my co-coordinator, Dan. Thank you, Courtney. And I, there are a couple other people we need to thank, those who are uh, doing the, the behind the scenes work, the people who are transcribing our session, and the, the people who are doing the video recording, and also the great assistance that we received in the room. We had technical issues that were not, not caused by them at all, but they really helped us uh, make sure that we had a session that was excellent. So thanks for all that background support. And, and Laura Bacall, uh, uh, who is online. GF, the Global Forum for Media Development is our secretariat. And so Laura, who is joining us online, you can see her in the middle. She's waving. She did a lot of the background work to make this session happen. It, these things don't just happen out of thin air. So we thank you all for all your hard work and for waking up in the middle of the night in Spain to join us for this session. Thank you all. If you want to connect with us, we'll be, I'll be uh, just standing out in the lobby here and we'd love to connect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.